Uh, I'm uh, very happy to introduce Russell Miller, who will talk about computable structure, the structure theory with non-computable structures. Right. Thank you, Anush, and thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I, normally, with the last talk of a, of a meeting, I, I would thank you all for sticking it out until the very end here and, and staying on. Um, somehow, with this year and this week, it, it feels more like we have one last hour to do mathematics before we all have to go back to reality. Um, Reality has been challenging, so, um, well, we will go back after this, and I trust we will all be stout of heart and face it. Um, but for now, yes, thank you for coming, and thank you to the organizers, and in fact, since this is the last talk, let us all quickly say thank you to the organizing committee, program committee, and the people who made this meeting happen. So, Anush, certainly, here. Thank you. Um, and Chris is here too, and Antonio, possibly. Um, okay, and let me get this one last hour started then. Um, starting it off with a, um, if this goes, um, hmm. okay, I was able to, to go forward and back when we tried this out. And now all of a sudden it, it yeah, you need to you need to click uh, activate the PDF file again, like just hit on it so that it's focused. It's it, it, that uh -huh. is the focus. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Right. Sure. Okay. Um, so yes. Yeah, so, so starting off with um, a, a thought which is not directly relevant here, but I think we'll set a tone for it. So I'll let you read part of this on yourself. It's from um, from John Stilwell's paper in 1972 in the JSL. Um, the, this is the introduction, and I've elided the part, the description of Stilwell's own theorem, but I'll tell you about it. Um, he proves in this paper that the theory of the Turing degrees as a structure under jump and meet and join, that theory is decidable if you take the quantifiers, if you take for all d to mean for all degrees D outside a measure zero set. Okay, um, so, so you have Lebesgue measure on the reals, of course, and since Turing degrees are countable sets of reals, one does get measure on the Turing degrees, so this makes sense. And it's a nice theorem. Um, Stilwell's characterization is what struck me. The, the last paragraph here, which I'm quoting in full, it is hoped that this type of result will be welcome after the depressing complexification of the theory of degrees in recent years. Now, um, it might be a good thing that I'm giving this talk online um, because to, to some of my colleagues in computability, those are fighting words. You know, the, so the previous 15 years before this paper, 15 years ago precisely, had seen the, the first um, injury priority argument by Friedberg and Muchnick. And in the ensuing 15 years, um, a great deal had been done with priority arguments. Infinite injury was introduced. And the theory of the Turing degrees, without you know, ignoring measure, just the theory of the Turing degrees, had proven to be way more complicated than anybody had really expected. Um, even just the CE Turing degrees were shown to be over the top complicated in, in various rigorous senses that I won't go into. Um, I would note, for instance, I mean, the, the meat operator that Stilwell uses isn't always defined, right? He can use it because it is defined outside a set of measure zero. So he can get away with that. Um, and much of his theorem is along the same lines. It's saying that various things which, um, it, his first paragraph to me almost inverts things, various things which, various pathologies which had been discovered to take place can be ignored if you look only at degrees up to a set of measure zero. So, um, well, still well found the previous 15 years depressing. Um, he wanted simple results that you could, from which you could draw conclusions very quickly and kind of see what was going on. Um, and what had been happening instead was these increasingly technical results showing a very complex theory. 
Now, I'm not going to talk about any measure theory today. Um, I'm going to go to computable structures, computable structure theory very soon. Um, so I'm, I'm putting this out here essentially just to set a tone, but I, I'll refer back to it once or twice. Um, and I hope you'll understand what I'm trying to say with it. Um, let's, so, so let's go to computable structure theory and let's start with a fairly early development. Um, so early on computable model theory, so-called because it was very much modeled on model theory itself, decided to look at the notion of categoricity. And so it's always good to start with something that everybody remembers. The intuitive notion of categoricity from model theory was that a theory is categorical if it uniquely determines the structure in which it holds, right? So, um, so it should be consistent, it should hold in some structure. And somehow the theory just determines every single aspect of this structure. That's the intuitive notion, but it flopped, right? I mean, th this can happen for finite structures, but we were, I mean, Charlie Steinhorn's talk to the contrary. Um, many model theorists regard the finite structure situation as trivial, and in terms of categoricity, it basically is. Um, the lowenheim skolem theorem shows that this definition it just is vacuous once you get to structures with infinite, two theories, I'm sorry, with infinite models. And so the, the model theorists said, okay, well, back to the drawing board, let's, let's try to work around this. And they said, okay, we'll fix a particular cardinal, kappa, infinite cardinal, and say that a theory T is categorical in the power kappa, if it has a unique model up to isomorphism of cardinality kappa, right? And that turned out great. I mean, that, that, that makes sense. You know, I mean, obviously you, you, this wouldn't work if, if T could have, if you allowed yourself to consider models of different cardinality because they clearly wouldn't be isomorphic. But um, if you restrict to a single cardinality, um, then you get this notion which has been extraordinarily fruitful in model theory. And there are all kinds of interesting questions about how categoricity in one power affects categoricity in another, right? Morley's theorem comes out of this, all kinds of stuff. So that was the background in model theory. In computable structure theory, um, it's natural to ask, okay, if an isomorphism exists, how hard is it actually to compute one? And as a first example of a situation where it's very, very easy, um, it was natural to go to a, the standard example from model theory, um, the theory of dense linear orders without endpoints, which is omega categorical. And of course, in computable structure theory, we're essentially always concerned only with countable models. So omega categoricity is, is the interesting situation. Um, dense linear orders without endpoints um, has a standard back and forth construction proving its omega categoricity. And that construction is about as effective as you can imagine. You know, if you're trying to compute an isomorphism, all you need an isomorphism between two, two particular countable models, A and B, you just need to be able to enumerate the domains of those structures, the elements in the domains, which, you know, I mean, I would hope you can do that. And then you need to know the, the less than relations themselves on those domains. And with that, the, the standard back and forth construction it goes through perfectly effectively, right? So now, first of all, as I say, assuming that you can enumerate the domains, it should be a, a given basically. So throughout the rest of this talk, our countable structures will always have domain omega, because if you can enumerate the domain of a structure, you're basically saying, here's element number zero, here's element number one, here's element number two, blah, blah, blah. And so what, you know, so just call them by the natural numbers, name them by the natural numbers that way. Okay. Um, and so under that assumption, to compute an isomorphism, all you need to know is the atomic diagrams of the two structures, right? So you can tell which elements of A are less than which other elements of A and likewise for B. And with that, you can do the back and forth construction always just searching for an element which, which can be the image of the current thing on which you want to define the isomorphism. 
Okay. So if you're taking this idea and trying to run with it and trying to define an effective notion of categoricity, the first stab is to say, okay, well, um, so I'm still gonna talk about theories here. We'll switch over to structures soon enough. But the first step is to say, well, a theory should be computably categorical if for any two countable models of the theory, there's a computable isomorphism between them. Um, one advantage of saying that the domain is always omega is that a map from one domain to the other is just a map from omega to omega. So we have a perfectly good notion of computable, right? Computable by a Turing machine. Excuse me. Yes. These countable models, do we assume something like they are atomic diagrams are computable or it's just average? Um, right. So, so that's exactly what's coming up here. This is the first stab, right? And one, just like in the model theory case, it flops. Um, there are a few trivial cases where this works out, but that's it. Um, because a computable isomorphism between two such structures allows you to compute the atomic diagram of either one from the other, right? If you want to know what's true in, in B, you just say, okay, compute, figure out for, for the elements you're interested in, figure out their images in A and see if it's true in A from the atomic diagram in A. Um, inverses of computable bijections are always computable. And so, so yeah, so, so this doesn't work unless all the models here have exactly, have atomic diagrams of exactly the same Turing degree, um, which could happen maybe in a case of something like the complete graph on omega many vertices, but you know, it's, it's only in trivial cases. Um, so, okay, just like the model theorists did, we back off and say, all right, all right, pull in our horns a little bit here. And the definition that evolved was that a theory T is computably categorical if for all, computa for all computable models, which I define right there, computable models of T, there is a computable isomorphism between them. And so by computable model, I simply mean that the atomic diagram should be computable, right? Use a Gödel coding and that, that's very well defined. All right, now um, keeping this in mind, the, the first thing I want to do right here is to explain Okay, this is a definition for theories. When you actually see the definition of computable categoricity, normally it's stated for a single structure or at least a single isomorphism type. And the reason for that, well, first of all, some theories are computably categorical just by virtue of having no computable models at all. And that, that's totally cheap, right? And even if there are computable models, um, Sometimes you would get, you would satisfy the preceding definition for, for again, for very cheap reasons. Um, Peano arithmetic is an example. It has many computable models, but only one that has a computable presentation. And that one, it does happen that between any two copies, they're computable copies, there is a computable isomorphism. Um, Tenenbaum's theorem tells you that non-standard models of PA, even countable ones, cannot have computable models. So, so somehow this, this wasn't really a property of a theory. It, it was a property of a structure. And so the definition that one almost always sees and the one we'll be using the rest of today is that a structure and particularly a computable structure, A, is computably categorical if for every computable structure B that is already known to be isomorphic to A, there is a computable isomorphism. So for instance, the countable dense linear order without endpoints has this property for the reasons we discussed. Um, but yeah, it, it, so it's, it's viewed as a property of structures rather than a property of theories for us. Um, all right, but so, so that, that's a oh, slightly technical comment. It's just good to get it straight. The bigger comment that I wanted to make about that is that unconsciously, people made a choice when they chose that last definition, okay? So the, the idea of defining computable categoricity was that you sort of, you want to rule out 
dirty tricks like making atomic diagrams have different Turing degrees, right? You, you know, I mean, if, if the atomic diagram is, un is not computable, how the heck do you expect me to compute an isomorphism? <laughs> so, you know, come on. Um, so so you, can, you can definitely understand the thinking behind that definition. And that is the definition that evolved independently, both in the West and in what was then the Soviet Union. It was called auto stability in, in Russia, but it was the same definition. But as I say, there was a choice made when they chose that because there is another way to go about this. Um, and so here's a definition, which I will put a property that's called uniform computable categoricity that applies to any countable structure you want. And it says, okay, I'm not going to restrict myself to computable models. I'm just going to say for any two structures, B and C that are isomorphic to A, if you give me the atomic diagrams of B and C as an Oracle for an Oracle Turing machine, well, there is an Oracle Turing machine which can take that Oracle and no matter what B and C you choose, can take that Oracle and compute an isomorphism from B onto C, right? So the old version was, let's only look at computable structures because the other ones are nasty. This version is, we'll look at all these structures, but you gotta give me the atomic diagram. If, if, if it's non-computable, okay, fine, as long as you give it to me as an Oracle, I can deal with that. Um, one further difference here, there is a uniformity here, right? There, this says there's a single Turing functional that will, that will do this for any two copies, B and C, of the original structure A. Um, and in a moment, I'll, I'll mention some of the history here and you'll see how we got from there to here. Um, but let's think first, is this really much different? I mean, come on, you know, you know Computable structures cover a lot of things. Are, are, are you really going to find significant differences between looking at computable structures only and looking at all countable structures, but requiring that you have a copy of the atomic diagram? Okay, well, so we can consider this. Um, the first definition, computable categoricity for a computable structure, defines a certain subset of the set of all computable structures. And so it's a subset of omega if you use indices for these things. And the complexity of the definition is pi one one. Okay, there is a quantifier in there over reals because you say for any second computable structure isomorphic to the first one, if there exists an isomorphism, then there exists a computable isomorphism. And saying if there exists an isomorphism is a quantifier over Cantorspin, right? basically, right? Over reals, over functions from omega to omega. Okay. Um, all the rest of it is is arithmetic. So ultimately, that the the well, the complexity of that particular definition is pi one one. The same thing is true of the definition I just gave you for uniform computable categoricity. That definition on its face is pi one one. It's now looking not just at computable structures, but at all structures. So it's really defining a set of reals, you know, atomic diagrams of countable structures in a fixed language. But, um, but that definition, again, its own complexity is pi one one. Question, of course, are they, are they really that hard? I mean, could there be simpler equivalents for those definitions? And so just, uh, sorry, six, years ago now, um, a, a theorem was proven by these six authors, um, Stefan at least is here, I know, and theorem was proven that the first definition I gave you, computable categoricity, really is pi one one hard. I mean, it's, it's complete at the level pi one one. Um, so you just can't do any better than that, right? Whereas sometime earlier in 1987, um, there was a paper of Ash Knight, Manass, and Slayman, and then independently there was work by John Chisholm at the same time, showing that the definition of uniform computable categoricity is equivalent to a sigma zero three definition. So something much, much simpler. 
And that's kind of a surprise. I, I mean, the, the paradox is that when you take this broader definition that covers all countable structures and, and specifically requires computing isomorphisms on the non-computable ones, um, the definition turns out to be so much cleaner, right? Mm -hmm. This is sort of the Stillwell moment, right? I, I mean, which definition do you like better? The one that's really hard, the one that, that I mean, the proof of pi 1, 1 completeness for this thing is a serious proof. Um, you know, this is the mountain climber definition. You know, you want to prove that it's pi 1, 1 complete even just because the definition is there, for God's sakes. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's important. I mean, it's very good to know that this is true, but somehow just proving the theorem was an accomplishment in itself um, and would have been even if the theorem were not were not so important. Um, but the Stillwell side of things is, hey, if we put in the non-computable structures, we get something much nicer and simpler. And as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of the history here. Um, the, the, the Stillwell definition gives you a very nice syntactic equivalent. So, so it really tells you something about what's going on. I call it the Stillwell definition. I, I'm, I mean, as I say, Ash Knight, Manass, and Slayman, and independently Chisholm. Um, just so you understand what happened, they did not start off with this uniform version where a single Turing functional works for every pair of copies B and C of the structure A. Um, they defined a notion called relative computable categoricity, where you say that, okay, you can always compute an isomorphism between the B and the C from the atomic diagrams, but there's no particular uniformity. Just for every B and C, there's some way to compute it. But when they did the proof, what, what they proved essentially here is that one and two are equivalent um, and item three really follows immediately from that. Um, they, they weren't focused on uniformity, but it, it comes basically for free. Um, what they proved, so, so let, me, let me suggest that you think about it this way. First of all, the relative computable categoricity version is the same as the uniform version up to a finite tuple of constants. You know, if, if, if you were talking about dense linear orders with endpoints, you would need constants that name the two endpoints, right? Without that, I mean, you couldn't just guess what the endpoints were. But if, you, if you're given those two constants in, in the signature, then you can use the atomic diagram to find them and then do the back and forth in between. So relative computable categoricity is the same as uniform up to the addition of finitely many constants. And then the middle item, the one that I call the syntactic item, um, I'm not gonna go into the details on this, but it's essentially saying that the structure has a family of existential formulas. And I just said, identifying each tuple in A. So every tuple in A is realized by one of these existential formulas. And each formula has the property that it realizes only the tuples from one particular orbit under automorphisms. So the, the, each formula in the family defines an orbit under automorphisms. Um, and then every, every tuple, of course, sits in some orbit and there is some formula in the family defining it. The formulas all have to be existential and the whole list of them has to be computably enumerable. Okay. So that really gives you the syntactic gist of what you need to, to get computable categoricity. Except that if you said computable categoricity in the original definition, nothing like this is true, right? I mean, the original definition is pi one one complete. Um, the, the bullet point two here is the part which actually shows you that this is sigma zero three. Um, you can write that in sigma zero three format, it turns out. Um, and you know the pi one one completeness of the original definition says there is no nice syntactical equivalent like this. So somehow throwing in the non-computable structures made everything much smoother and, and helped us understand what's going on. Okay. Russell? Yes. Um, it may be that I'm clouded by three and a half days of joint meetings by now. Is it obvious that that theorem extends to, that it relativizes to where A is not computable? Um, there's, 
there's a little bit of work to be done. So it's not quite obvious, but it does relativize. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I stated it for computable structures A so as to avoid that question, but um, not a problem. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Since you're asking um, question, I had a quick question about yeah. this pi one one completeness result. This is for structures in some particular language or? Uh... Um, so you could certainly do it for undirected graphs, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Um, yeah. Um, many other classes too, that, that's a whole different branch of study in computable structure theory. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I want to give a couple of hands-on examples, um, which are not computably categorical, but are close. And they will again get towards the theme of this talk, which has maybe finally come into view here, which is that throwing in the non-computable structures somehow can illuminate everything. It, it can give you better, cleaner, often simpler results. So first of the two hands-on examples, we're going to move to fields here, which is where I usually live. Um, you all know this first field F, um, the algebraically closed field of characteristic zero and countable transcendence degree over the rationals. Okay, very nice field, certainly countable, but it's not computably categorical. It does have computable presentations. That's not too difficult, um, but it's not computably categorical. And the reason is if somebody gives you the atomic diagram of this field, you got to start wondering, okay, here's an element. Is it algebraic or transcendental over the rationals? And there, there's, there's no finite piece of the atomic diagram that will ever convince you that it's transcendental. Right? Being transcendental means realizing a non-principal type. So even from the elementary diagram, no finite piece of it could possibly say this element is transcendental. Um, and without that, I, I mean, one has to go and prove this, of course, and do a lot of diagonalization and stuff. But basically, without that, you can see that you're sunk right away. Um, what it takes, if you're looking at computable copies of this field, what it takes to compute isomorphisms is an oracle for the halting problem. Because with the halting problem, you can say, okay, you know, here's an element. If I search for an algebraic relation on it, on it and its powers, will I ever find one? That's a halting problem question. You know, if I do this search, will it ever, will it ever halt? Will, will I ever find this? The answer is yes, then the element was algebraic. And so you can go ahead and search and figure out what, what its minimal polynomial is and go on from there. If the answer is no, then you say, okay, this is a transcendental. And the same thing for two elements if you're trying to decide algebraic independence. So if you have an oracle for the halting problem and you have the atomic diagrams of the two fields, um, again, the atomic diagrams are computable, right? In this case, we're looking at computable fields. So with the halting problem oracle, you can enumerate a transcendence basis for F itself and for any other copy of F that anybody gives you. And the transcendence basis, you can just pair up bijectively any old way you want, it doesn't matter. Um, and then just using the atomic diagrams, because the fields are algebraically closed, it's pretty simple to extend the map to get an isomorphism between the two structures. So we say that this field, again, this is back to the first definition now, looking at computable structures only, computable models here. Um, this field is zero prime computably categorical. It's not computably categorical, but with a zero prime oracle, it is, so to speak. Um, Here's a different field. This one is actually totally algebraic over Q. Totally might mean something. This one is algebraic over Q. Um, it will once again be zero prime computably categorical. This one is also pretty simple to describe. I'm going to start by throwing in squ the square root of every prime. And then I'm going to put in the fourth roots of certain primes, a fourth root of the nth prime Pn goes into this field when and if n appears in the halting set itself, okay? Now there is a computable presentation of this because you, you, you can build L very easily and then you just sort of adjoin fourth roots of primes when numbers appear in the halting problem and 
you know, put in everything they generate and you can get a computable presentation of K. Now this also is not computably categorical. Um, there's, for, I mean, the, the problem is that if, if you've put in the a for so, sorry, Russell, computable presentation or computably enumerable presentation? Because you have to just go through, right? Well, so, so what I want is to give a, a, a copy of the field on domain omega where the atomic diagram is computable. Right? That, that's what a computable presentation means. Okay, okay, okay. Right? Yeah, I see. And that makes it hard to know for sure if there is a fourth root of a given prime in the field. If there is one, the atomic diagram will eventually show you it. But if there isn't one, you'll never really know for sure. You'll just say, I haven't found it yet, but it might still be out there. Okay. okay. And the other thing I, I make clear about this, um, if, if you're trying to build an isomorphism between two copies of this field, the sticking point is the following. You put in, for whatever prime you're interested in, P, you put in a square root of P, say it's a PN, let's say, you put in a square root of PN, and that of course generates the other square root of PN, it's negative. And in the second copy of the field, there are again, plus and minus square roots of PN, and you can find them. But the question is, which, which of the two in the one field should map to which of the two in the other field, okay? Now it could be that it doesn't matter. If there's no fourth root of PN, then you're free to do whichever you want. If there is a fourth root of PN, then that sort of identifies one of the square roots of PN. One square root of PN has a square root of its own. The other doesn't, right? I mean, uh, just to be very clear here, you're putting in one fourth root of PN that generates a second one. They're both square roots of one of the square roots of PN. Um, and if you know that N is in the halting problem, so I'm looking now in the middle of the slide at the two sort of strategies here. If you know that N is in the halting problem, then you know what to do. Wait for a fourth root of PN to appear. And that will tell you which way the square roots should be paired up. Okay. If you know that N is not in the halting problem, then again, you know what to do. Just map the two of them to the two of them either way. It doesn't matter because, you know, if, if there's no fourth root, then the two square roots of PN are in the same orbit. Okay. But of course, you, to, do, to know which strategy to use, you need a zero prime oracle. And so this, in terms of computable categoricity, this seems very much like the previous example. Um, you need a zero prime oracle for both. But, I mean, this is something that bothered me for quite a number of years here, um, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, they, the situations are not quite the same. And what finally, I mean, I was not the one who figured out how to distinguish them, but what finally allowed me to, to, to put a finger on what I felt was different um, was the following. Let's get away from computable categoricity and go to that broader definition, uniform computable categoricity. Okay, so K was the algebraically closed field, you remember. For K, no, I'm wrong. K was the field with the square roots and the fourth roots of primes. Okay, K is the algebraic field over the rationals. Um, for K, there is a Turing functional phi, which would get what, which would do what you want, except that it needs an oracle for zero prime to do it, okay? The zero prime oracle will tell it which strategy to use for each particular prime piece of N, and then the atomic diagram gives you everything else you need. F was the algebraically closed field. And for F, that doesn't work. And in fact, there's no fixed oracle that you could put in the way I put in zero prime here and make it work. Finding a transcendence basis simply requires a jump over the atomic diagram, right? I mean, it's, it's just intrinsically that difficult. Um, Again, that's not the sort of thing that one tries to prove in a talk like this, but uh, I, I think a lot of you can sort of see, um, you know, if delta of A and delta of B already had degree zero prime, then throwing in a zero prime oracle doesn't really add anything. But, you know, you wouldn't, you'd need 
a jump of that in order to find a transcendence basis. Okay, and so that's the difference here. Um, and again, going to the non-computable structures, the non-computable versions of the algebraically closed field, especially, um, really lets you sift that out and say, aha, this is how they're different. Um, the general theorem here was proven just a few years ago. Barbara Chima, who spoke yesterday, and Matthew Harrison Trainer, who was a postdoc at Waterloo at the time and who also spoke in this meeting two days ago, um, showed that essentially this always happens. For every countable structure, there's a certain ordinal number of jumps that you need from the atomic diagram. And there is a certain sort of countable amount of information, a certain subset S of omega. S is not uniquely determined and even up to Turing degree, it might not be. But the number, the alpha, the ordinal is uniquely determined. You know exactly how much information you need in order to compute isomorphisms between these structures. Okay. Um, sometimes you can reduce alpha a bit by adding finitely many constants, right? Um, I'll mention that in a second. And Barbara and Matthew also showed that this really is sharp. I mean, once you take the least such alpha, you need exactly that much oracle in, in, for certain specific copies B and C of the given A, you need that much oracle to compute an isomorphism. <coughs> um, so this is a really nice theorem. I, I'm, I, I, and I, I say this as somebody who worked on this problem and did not get to this result. Um, it's, it's a very good thing. Um, again, what it means for our specific example, the algebraically closed field F that we had has categoricity ordinal one. Right, that's the number of jumps that you, sorry, number of jumps that you need to compute isomorphisms. Um, uh, sorry, Russell, can you, can you go back one, uh, one slide? Uh, I think so, yes. So in, in this theorem, you just require S to be a set, so like it couldn't have any complexity and then you relativize uh, with respect to it, so no. then. So S, it, it's like the zero prime for, for the field K, right? Um, it's sort of information about the structure. Oh, I got to got to come. So S then there is for S, such that for all B for and all C. different copies of B and C. Yeah. Okay. All okay, different okay, copies B and C of A. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's the point. Yes. Um, and yeah. So so the K that I mentioned, and in fact every algebraic field extension of Q, sort of is computably categorical if you have the right fixed countable amount of information um, just about the isomorphism type of the field. What, con what you know, algebraic numbers are in there, how many conjugates they have, and how do you distinguish the conjugates which are in different orbits. Um, and for finite transcendence degree, I might mention that's a situation where adding constants makes a difference, right? If, if the transcendence degree were one, you'd have a problem finding, the tr finding a transcendental but if you put in a constant that names a transcendental, then you're much better off, right? Then, then the ordinal is zero. So, okay, so, so once again, you know, the, the theme is still coming through that throwing in the non-computable structures and dealing with them really lets you say how difficult it is to compute isomorphisms. How many jumps do you need and what fixed countable information about the structure do you need? Okay, um, I have one last question in mind to go through here. Um, a different question, still about fields and is now always about algebraic fields. Um, so let me remind you here for a field or even a ring, we have a set called HTP of K, the field, um, that stands for Hilbert's 10th problem. HTP of K is essentially the set of polynomial equations over K in several variables, as many as you want, which have solutions in the field. Right? The original Hilbert's 10th problem had the ring Z, the integers in place of K. And it was finally, it, it was in fact Hilbert's 10th problem. And it was resolved in 1970. Um, HTP of the ring Z is undecidable. It's actually as hard as the halting problem. 
okay? Um, it's clear that HTP of K, it's defined, this is not, not quite a definition in the strict model theoretic sense, but still it's clear that this is defined by a sigma one formula. So you can search for solutions. You can always enumerate HTP of K if you have the atomic diagram of K, all right? But at least for the integers, you can't always, you can't decide it. Um, I'm mentioning this other, the sub problem here, R sub K, the root set. It's the same thing, but only for polynomials of one variable. So here's an F, does it have a root in the field? Okay. Now, sometimes it's possible to compute HTP of K. I mean, the obvious example is if K itself is algebraically closed, which in this, we're talking about extensions of Q here, algebraic extensions. So if K is the algebraic closure of Q, um, it's also true for the real closure. Um, I have a few other examples coming, as a matter of fact. Um, when K is at the other extreme, just the rationals, RQ is decidable, and that goes back to the 19th century, but it's a huge open problem whether HTP of Q is decidable or not. We don't know, right? It could be as hard as the halting problem, same has happened for Z, or it could, <coughs> it could be decidable, but nobody knows how. Um, or it could conceivably be somewhere in between, which would be a, a shock, but nothing rules it out so far. Um, it is pretty easy to build computable fields where HTP of K and RK are as hard as the halting problem. Um, and in fact, we've done that already. I mean, the, the, it would take the halting problem to determine whether that field that I called K earlier on has fourth roots of primes or not, right? So, Definitely, there are situations where HTP of K is harder than, it, than the atomic diagram and other situations where it's not any harder. And the question, which I'm going to convert here into a question about computable fields, the, the, the poorly stated question was, how likely is it for, a compute, for now a computable field here to have to be able to decide its own HTP, which means the, for a computable field, that means to have HTP of K computable, okay? Um, well, problem, what do you mean? How likely is it? Uh, uh, gotta, gotta get this straight. First, how do we measure likelihood when you're looking at countably many computable fields? I would think the most natural thing to try is some sort of asymptotic density, right? List out the computable fields, and I mean, not, not to say that this is necessarily decidable, but ask what fraction of the first N of them for any N have HTP computable, and then take the limit of those fractions as N goes to infinity. And you might conceivably get an answer like, you know, in the limit, none of them, you know, limit zero, many of them are have HTP of K computable or almost all of them do, or possibly one half of them or something. But the fact is, um, the, as, a, as a voting procedure, this sucks um, because it totally depends on the list of fields that you choose, right? Uh, on the order in which you list out these fields. It, it's, you can try to specify certain requirements for the list, but um, it's still generally possible to front load with the the list with fields where what you want to happen happens. Um, so this just doesn't fly. What does work out, and you might guess from the theme of the talk, is look at all the subfields of Q bar, not just the computable ones. There are two to the omega many of those, continuum many. If you got really lucky, maybe fewer than continuum many would be on one side or the other, but um, that, that doesn't actually happen. Um, so, okay, what do you do? And the answer is you resort to topology. There's a standard topology on the set of all subfields of Q bar. Um, goes by a few different names. Um, so I was working on this with uh, uh, Kirsten Eisentrager and Caleb Springer and Linda Westrick. And we knew about this topology, but when Linda described it in the talk, Florian Pop said, oh, that's the Etal topology. 
And we said, oh, okay, nice. Um, and then it also turned out, oh, it's the via Taurus topology. Um, it, it, there are several different ways of getting this topology. Um, time is a bit short, so I don't think I'm going to go through the details too much. I'll simply say, under this topology, you get a homeomorph of Cantor space, okay? Um, essentially, the, to, decide, to name a subfield of Q bar, you want to keep saying, okay, is root two in it or not? Is root three in it or not? Sometimes it's, sometimes you don't have an option, but you basically have a whole sequence of binary questions to answer. And as, as I say, I'm not going to spend time on this, but you, you wind up saying, okay, the paths through this tree correspond to the subfields of Q bar, and those paths um, form a copy of Cantor space. Okay. So you, you can also do this and then mod out by isomorphism. And once again, you get a copy of Cantor space. Um, you can say specifically um, a basis for it. And in Cantor space, this is the basis of the Klopin sets um, is given by saying, okay, uh, the Klopin sets are the, the sets of extensions K, algebraic fields over Q, which contain a given number field F. So number fields are finitely generated always. So this is sort of finitely much positive information. K has to contain a certain few number of elements and K must have no root of some particular polynomial here. So there's finitely much negative information as well. These things stay out of K. <coughs> All right. Um, so that gives you a basis here. Cantor space has the property of bare, so it makes sense to talk about meager and co-meager sets. And I never dreamed, and I, I never dreamed I would have time to prove this, and I don't. It's, it's an entire talk by itself, really. But one of the things that the four of us proved is that for a co-meager set of isomorphism types, L, of algebraic fields here, um, First of all, you can present L in such a way that the atomic diagram does not compute the root set. And again, the root set was just concerned with one variable polynomials. If you don't compute the root set, then you certainly don't compute HTP of the field. So in, you know, in terms of bare category, this happens in almost all situations. Um, however, Second bullet point, this is interesting. The HTP set is only as hard as the root set. And that's surprising because it, it's, I mean, for, for people who work on this, I mean, they, they look at the rationals and they say, oh, R sub Q is, is computable, but HTP of Q, as far as we know, is very hard. Um, how do you get the, the, the answers for all these polynomials just from knowing the answers for single variable polynomials. And as I say, I'm not going to try to prove that here, but you do. Um, those two are equally hard. And then third of all, okay, so, so both of those are strictly, uh, are not as easy as delta of K, the atomic diagram, but they're pretty close, okay? The atomic diagram, the root set, and the, the HTP of the field all have Turing equivalent jumps, okay? So the root set and the HTP are not as hard as you might've thought. I mean, they're, they are above the atomic diagram, but only by a little bit, okay? In, in our language, they're low relative to the atomic diagram. Um, and this gives you some particular results that, that um, these presentations all can enumerate sets that are not diophantine. So that's different from the ring Z, where every CE set is diophantine, is existentially definable in the ring. And also, there's no existential, no diophantine interpretation of the integers with plus and times in any of these presentations. Again, this applies to these weakly one generic fields, but those are a co meager set of the entire space. So it applies to most fields in the sense of bare category. Okay, um, this is what I just said, basically. Um, last paragraph in, in this slide, um, 
you can actually use this to build a lot more computable algebraic fields for which the HTP of K is decidable. Um, you don't use the theorem, but you use the proof of it. Um, uh, I mean, Q bar was already one such, the real closure of Q was another, but it turns out there are densely many and in, um, not continuum many because there are only countably many computable fields. But um, you can get this nice result, which I'm not aware we knew about before, at least the density result here. Um, so that's good. Um, we answered another question. This is in fact what we initially asked about definability of various subsets of the rationals and subsets of the field. Um, and so the, the integers and also in, in a field L, the set of, the ring of algebraic integers in L, the ring O sub L have neither an existential nor a universal definition in L provided that L is weakly one generic, again. For number fields, um, Z and O sub L both do have universal definitions. So that's, you know, that's a difference here. Number fields are not generic, definitely. Um, and so just so you know, we wound up generalizing this to sets that are not rings. And it has to do with the concept of thinness from the Hilbert irreducibility theorem. Um, uh, Philip Dittmann and Arno Fame uh, saw a talk by Linda Westrick and in fairly short order extended these results with a totally different approach in model theory and showed that in fact for, for co-meager many Ls, no subring of L can be first order definable, never mind existentially or universally, it just can't be definable at all in L, which is a really nice result. That's actually what Caleb Springer was asking about when he first posed this question two years ago. Um, so, okay, so again, I, I, I'm not going to try to prove this at all. I didn't even write up slides because I knew I wouldn't be able to. Um, I'll just bring this back to the larger point here. We are still doing computable structure theory. I, I hope everybody agrees on that. We're considering effective procedures, uncountable structures. We're allowing the structures themselves to be non-computable, using, them using their atomic diagrams as oracles sometimes a jump or several of the atomic diagram as an oracle, um, and asking about computing isomorphisms or enumerating relations, enumerating their complements, or you can decide the relations, all these sorts of things. Um, and doing this does often give results that, well, they have greater scope because they cover more structures, but they're also sometimes more illuminating. I mean, there are times when Stillwell's approach really does seem to pay off. Um, so I'll, you know, the, I, I've gone through these already. This is just review, but the, I'll throw in the last bullet point, which we mentioned two slides ago, that doing this does in fact sometimes lead to new results about computable structures, right? I mean, the specific example here, we got a construction of a number of previously unknown computable algebraic fields K where you can decide Hilbert tenth problem. Okay, so with that, I think I've, made my point and it's time to stop. And I will thank all of you for sticking around. And if you have any questions, I hope there's time to answer a few of them. And I'm certainly happy to hear from anybody who has longer questions. Well, thank you very much, Russell. Uh, are, are there any questions to Russell? Yeah, there is. Uh, do you, so, Russell, you don't see a chat, but we just got a compliment on your talk, uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, which I which I joined very much. It was a greatly explained talk, and I I learned a lot. Uh, so, any but any nevertheless, any questions? Early on, when you were starting with categoricity and then changing, uh, it became clear why you needed to go switch from theories to structures with uh, computable categoricity. Mm -hmm. But once you switch to the uniform version, then it seems like that would make sense yeah. for first order theory. Yeah. Th this, has, um, has anyone worked on that? I don't think so. Um, I, I've actually sort of had in mind to suggest that to a graduate student or two sometime soon. Um, but if anybody here knows of any 
thoughts along these lines, I'd be happy to hear about them. Um, as I say, the, the Chima and Harrison trainer result is only three years, well, again, four years old at this point, 2021, I'm getting used to it. Um, and so, you know, it would be good to ask around, but uh, I, there hasn't been a lot of time and I don't think anybody has gone that direction. It's a good question, definitely. Well, thanks. Nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Well, then let's thank Russell again for a great talk. Uh, and I thank everyone for attending this and all of the other talks. Uh, this this talk was the last one in the among the ASL invited talks. So yeah, I'm very happy that you guys could join.